Hello, everybody. I'm Steve Call. I am the Dean of the Graduate School of Journalism here at Columbia University. Welcome, everybody, to the 2021 John Chancellor Award Ceremony. This is a great pleasure every year because this is an award that honors uh, one of the great broadcast journalists of our time, John Chancellor, and the values and career that he exemplified. Uh, the award was established in uh, 1995 by Ira Lippmann, uh, who passed away about two years ago. He was a great friend of mine and others here at the school and a very generous and foresightful supporter of uh, journalism. I'd like to welcome and congratulate uh, Tony Bartlemy, our winner this year. He's a special projects reporter at The Post and Courier in South Carolina. Uh, and we'll be talking about him and with him uh, as, as the time goes along today. But congratulations, uh, Tony, and to everybody in that amazing newsroom of yours. I'd like to welcome all of the friends and family of Tony who are here today. This is a special kind of award ceremony because we get to focus on a single person and their life and career and character, and it's a lot of fun. It's great to have people close to the winner uh, with us and participating. I'm sorry that we're doing this virtually again this year, but uh, we're navigating our way, all of us, uh, through this, this complicated time. It's getting better, and I'm very hopeful that next year we'll be able to do it the old-fashioned way here at the university. Um, but uh, we're really fortunate to have an, an, what I'm sure is going to be a very engaging lineup of Tony's friends and, and uh, colleagues and family to uh, help pay tribute to him today. Before we get started, I just want to um, recognize some, some special guests. Uh, we have some past uh, winners of the Chancellor Award uh, with us today, and I'd like to welcome you guys back. Um, we um, have members of the uh, Chancellor Award Selection Committee on the call, uh, and uh, I just want to thank them and recognize them for the uh, real time and effort and deliberation they put into this process every year. It's such an important decision, and um, having participated for the last few years, um, I can tell you that it's done so thoughtfully and carefully uh, by a really dedicated group, so thank you. Um, and also, I'd like to welcome uh, two members of, the, of John Chancellor's family, uh, his uh, children, Mary and Laura Chancellor, uh, as well as Ira, Ira Lippmann's uh, three sons, uh, Ben, uh, Gus, and Josh. So welcome, everybody. Uh, when Ira brought the John Chancellor Award to, to Columbia in 2005, uh, he also had the foresight to create the John Chancellor uh, Scholarship at, at RJ School, which has uh, benefited over the years 19 different students with outstanding academic achievement and the leadership qualities of uh, John Chancellor. And uh, this year's Ch Chancellor Scholar is a student in our MS program uh, who I, I had the pleasure to teach in an admittedly very large class, but uh, had a really great conversation with him the other day. Uh, he's gonna be um, a wonderful exemplar of this scholarship program. Uh, Marco Schaden, uh, who before he came to Columbia was an editor at a local paper on Long Island, the Manhasset Press and uh, he received awards there for feature writing and in an in-depth series on a failed affordable housing project. Uh, he graduated from Marist College in 2018, where he majored in journalism and minored in political science. And uh, he was the editor in chief there of a digital um, sports publication uh, that he co-founded after the school newspaper stopped covering sports for reasons that we'll have to ask him about someday. Uh, but welcome, Marco, and uh, we're really proud of your association with this enterprise. Now, uh, let's take a minute to remember John Chancellor. Um, uh, as we do, I want to introduce Jelani Cobb, um, who will uh, come back and, and talk to us uh, in a minute or two about Ira and his commitments to civil rights and to journalism. Um, but as, as we prepare for that, let me just say a word about Jelani. He's the Ira A. Lippmann 
professor of journalism at the J School, and he's the director of the Lipman Center for Journalism and Civil and Human Rights, which has become a really important institution at the school made possible by, by Ira's uh, generosity and vision. And it supports annual fellowships that are intended to produce significant journalism about civil and human rights subjects uh, here and abroad. Jelani is also a staff writer at The New Yorker, uh, and he writes uh, frequently about race, politics, history, and culture. So uh, now let's watch a short video about John Chancellor, and uh, it's narrated by Tom Brokaw. And uh, on the back end of that, um, we'll hear from Jelani. This is an essay on journalism coming to you now from NBC News in New York, written by me, a reporter who's been around for a while. That's called a lead. Who, what, when, and where. John Chancellor talking about his favorite subject. Hello, I'm Tom Brokaw. Journalism was always more than just a job to John. It was a craft, a calling, a civic duty. John loved being a reporter, and he devoted himself to it all of his professional life. He cared about the fundamentals, and his work was distinguished by uncommon clarity and restraint. All that made him a shining example to so many of us who followed. And John's values are embodied to this day in the award that bears his name. He didn't start as an anchorman. John's first love was print. Chicago newspapers, and it shaped his world. This is John Chancellor on the 23rd floor of the Conrad Hilton. He got into television when it was new, brought what he learned about journalism with him, and never forgot it. The number of guards with the nine Negro students has been considerably diminished. John's civil rights reporting from Little Rock not only set a standard for television news, it won the respect of his print competitors as well. I'm in custody. And remember his famous line as he was escorted off the floor of the 1964 Republican convention? This is John Chancellor somewhere in custody. <laughs> well, here's what he said on the air just before that. I formally say that this is a disgrace, that the press should be allowed and the radio and television should be allowed to do their work at a convention on television. It was no joke to John. There was a journalistic principle involved. He witnessed and reported on lots of history during his years on the air. What we saw is impossible to forget and necessary to remember. John Chancellor was among the best known journalists in the world, but by choice and by temperament, he always took a back seat to the story itself. There are many perplexities about this conflict. He was the determined to know and understand and, and explain the events of the day. To John, that was a public trust and it was his passion. There's a little secret about journalism. We would do it for free if that were possible, but they actually pay us to do it. Since 1995, the John Chancellor Award for Excellence in Journalism has helped keep those values alive by recognizing them in others. Some of the most talented, if not always the best known journalists of our time. I know that John would be impressed with all of them and proud that they have been honored in his name. So. A final word of advice to us all from John himself. Get it right. Do the job the way it's supposed to be done. There's an old saying in Chicago journalism that applies here. You say your mother loves you, check it out. Those who are familiar with the Chancellor Awards know of its origins as Ira A. Lippmann's way of commemorating his hero, John Chancellor. Mr. Chancellor's reportage from the scene of the Little Rock integration crisis of 1957 helped expose the brutality of legal segregation and hasten its demise. This was a defining moment in our nation's history, but also a profoundly significant moment in Ira's personal history. He was then a 15-year-old high school student deeply concerned about racial justice, and the lessons of the moral import of a free press were not lost on him. 
Over the years, this award has become a way of not simply recognizing John Chancellor's heroism, but also the humanitarian instincts of the man who created the award in his name. Sadly, Ira Lippman passed away on September 16th, 2019. And in this, our third Chancellor Award ceremony without him, he is still very much missed by all who knew him. In his absence, we have diligently continued with the work that was so important to him in his lifetime. We are fortunate to have his sons, Josh, Gus, and Ben Lippman with us today. Our gratitude for Mr. Lippman's moral vision, his generosity, and his intelligence is undimmed by his departure. Thank you, Jelani. Um, now uh, to the main event, honoring Tony Bartleby. Um, I'm, uh, you know, I'm delighted again to be um, here as usual, but I think all of us on the panel um, felt strongly that it was, uh, you know, a great uh, opportunity to recognize uh, a reporter like Tony who has been working uh, far from the the spotlight in New York and uh, or the the kind of bi-coastal media world that has uh, grown up around us over the last 10 or 20 years and in, and instead has built an extraordinary uh, record um, in in journalism uh, working from a newsroom in South Car Carolina that continually punches above its weight. And uh, this is an award uh, that not only recognizes his his work, um, but um, but also his whole career. It's pretty much the only journalism award that I'm any of us is aware of um, that is for lifetime accomplishments. Uh, and it's designed to recognize reporters who are, I think, in the trenches is a phrase that I were used to use. Uh, so folks who are working. Um, not at the visible and, and most privileged levels of our field, but um, working also uh, on the ground with complex subjects, like science and environmental issues, uh, government corruption, and, and um, just accountability uh, in our democracy um, uh, where, <laughs> where it really matters and where reporting can really make a difference. Um, so these have been, over the years, journalists that we've tried to select for their courage and their integrity and whose work has had a significant impact on the, on the public good. And uh, I think we, we all agreed uh, very adamantly that Tony Bartlemy is such a reporter. Uh, his stories have affected positive change while also pushing the limits of what uh, local papers can, can deliver to their readers. Um, He's a special projects reporter at the Post and Courier in South Carolina. He's been both uh, versatile and prolific. Uh, I think we all uh, kind of Googled his body of work as we were getting toward the final decision and noticed that he was not so much of a special projects reporter to, uh, to avoid daily assignments and, and contributing to big news uh, coverage events, as you would imagine in a, in a newsroom of constrained resources. So he's a, a teammate as well as a, an author in his own right. Um, as I've mentioned, the Post and, and Courier is, you know, a real powerhouse uh, in local journalism these days, recognized as a, kind of a beacon in a in a uh, sort of a dark landscape of declining resources and struggling uh, businesses at the local level. Papers based in Charleston, South Carolina, was a finalist for the Pulitzer. Uh, this year, and it's won, um, won one a couple of years back um, for really ambitious uh, project reporting. Um, and um, Tony's been a big part of that. Uh, his environmental reporting has set national standards for quality and depth, from exploring what's happening to our uh, ocean plankton, which produces about half the oxygen we breathe. Uh, so a worthwhile subject, you would think. Um, but I remember reading that and being amazed that I hadn't learned any of these uh, findings before. Uh, he used in one project a thermal, a thermal imaging camera to show readers what 
emissions of carbon dioxide look like from uh, as they as they flow out of buses and planes and power plants. And uh, just this summer, he traveled to Greenland to show how melting ice has affected the South Carolina coast. His body of work shows a fierce determination to identify important and often uh, neglected issues in the community. And then uh, also to search in a journalistic way for answers uh, to those problems. In the early 90s, he wrote about black residents having difficulty getting home loans. Uh, and after that, banks in South Carolina changed. Uh, in the late 90s, he wrote about uh, sorry conditions of local schools and uh, education leaders launched what eventually became a $2 billion uh, retrofit. Uh, and about that time, he exposed a pedophile network at a local private school that was recently a subject of an award-winning award -winning documentary, What Haunts Us. In the mid 2000s, Tony's stories on mercury and the dangers of burning coal framed uh, the debate about the state's energy policies and prompted a utility to kill a billion dollar coal plant. This year, he took on perhaps his most ambitious work to date in the Post and Courier's ongoing investigative project, Uncovered, that seeks to expose government misdeeds across the state and especially in small towns. Instead of uh, going it alone with these stories or uh, bigfooting smaller papers around South Carolina, uh, Tony and his team dedicated uh, themselves to collaboration and they worked with other papers uh, offering their own stories for free and inviting other reporters into the project. To date, at least uh, 18 news organizations across South Carolina have signed on to this work and uh, within days of Tony's first report, the governor of South Carolina called for a new round of uh, ethics reforms and state lawmakers uh, filed bills to try to make that happen. Tony has war uh, won many other awards along the way, the Gerald Loeb Award for uh, Business Journalism and he's a three-time Pulitzer finalist. He's also the author of A Surgeon in the Village, an American Doctor Teaches Brain Surgery in Africa. Um, there's a special connection between uh, Tony's family and John Chancellor. That's uh, a wonderful coincidence about uh, this uh, uh, award. Um, that's a photo of uh, Joe Bartlemy, uh, his father, Tony's father, who actually worked with John Chancellor at NBC News, uh, where Joe was a vice president responsible for NBC's domestic news coverage and a local television pioneer. So uh, it's a wonderful connection to have discovered after the award was, was given. Now, uh, let me introduce the first of our five speakers today. These are friends and colleagues of Tony's who will help us mark this uh, occasion. First up is Kendra Hamilton, who worked with Tony when they were both starting out as reporters in the 1980s in Greenville, uh, South Carolina at the Greenville News Piedmont. She's originally from Charleston and her father, Lonnie Hamilton was a local community leader and the county's first uh, African-American council member. She went on to work at the Houston Chronicle before moving to Charlottesville. She got a doctorate, taught at UVA and served herself on Charlotte, Charlottesville's city council. Kendra also co-founded and administered uh, not one but two church-based community gardens that feed the hungry. And today she's a professor of English at Presbyterian College in Clinton, South Carolina. Uh, please welcome Kendra Hamilton. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Dean Cole, uh, distinguished guests. Thank you so much for inviting me to be a part of this ceremony. It is such a great honor to be allowed to pay tribute to my oldest friend in the profession and one of the finest journalists it's ever been my privilege to know, Tony Bartlemy. When Tony and I first met in the newsroom of the late and much lamented Greenville Piedmont in 1985, we entered a world of colorful characters and consummate prof uh, professionals that though we were hardly aware of it was already passing away. We had a courts reporter who could give Edna Buchanan a run for her money with a zinger lead, veteran columnists who could make 800 words sing and a stable of baby reporters who were eager to make their mark. And from the beginning, Tony stood out. He held the record among us for producing the most copy on a, a, a single day seven stories, as I recall it, 
Um, and his copy was always the cleanest, so the copy editor said. He was steady and good and just a machine of production, all without a murmur of complaint or the faintest whiff of braggadocio. Everyone wanted to be Tony's friend. A whole lot of people wanted to be Tony, but there was only one Tony. Tony made every day you worked with him on a story or sat beside him in the newsroom an adventure. But he didn't become a newsroom legend until he convinced another reporter to canoe the length of the Reedy River with him. Now this river running through the center of Greenville had for 40 years been covered by an overpass bridge. That was because it had functioned for almost 100 years as a sewer for the textile mills upstream. It ran red, blue, green, what have you, depending on what was cooking in the dye works, and it stank. Now the Clean Water Act had put an end to the worst of those practices, and by the 80s, the river was running relatively clean, but no one in Greenville knew that because they were driving over it every day. It was through the articles that emerged from the Reedy River Adventure that the city of Greenville became aware for the first time in 40 years that it had covered over the jewel in its crown. Visionary leadership tore down that bridge in 2002 and there's now a walking bridge over the falls and condos and shops and restaurants and a lively scene on both banks. But the seeds of all that glittering new development were planted when Tony said to Robert Barra, let's take a canoe ride and see what we find. So many of us who started out with Tony felt we had to move to larger papers to have a career that embodied the adventure of journalism. Others of us felt we had to leave the profession altogether uh, to write the books we felt we had in us or to have a direct impact on people's lives. Tony's career has quietly Effortlessly, effortlessly prove the fallacy of that thinking. Tony alone among us had an understanding that great stories are to be found wherever the journalist has the ability to see them. He was the first reporter in the state to cover the environment, to do it with steadfastness and determination and to sound the alarm bells over the threat of climate change. And as the storms intensify and the tides rise, and the number of flood days in my hometown has risen from two annually in the decade of my birth to 25 now, everyone can see what Tony has been reporting on, unsung and virtually unaccompanied for nearly 20 years. He has his eyes on another rising tide, that of corruption, as you pointed out, Dean. And his role in the Post and Courier's Uncovered series is empowering the state's small papers who have been crippled by the collapse of their financial model to uncover the looting of the state that's occurred as the officials, great and small, have taken advantage of the loss of community watchdogs. I feel that personally as my own mayor has been implicated in one of these scandals. Um, as Tony receives this most prestigious of honors today, those of us who have known him since the early days, who have followed his career and who love him like a brother are bursting with pride. And Tony, we are imagining that your dad, a newsman in the grand tradition who left us far before his time, is looking down on what you've accomplished amid a career that embodies the best of the adventure of journalism, as well as its mission of leaving the world just a little bit better than you found it with love and pride too. Congratulations, Tony. We love you, brother. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Hamilton. And, and um, uh, so I just want to now transition us to the next speaker. Um, that's uh, Doug Pardue. He's the former special projects editor and uh, at, the, at, at the South Carolina paper where Tony has been all these years and a mentor and a colleague um at the post and courier he's he's also overseen projects um at other papers usa today and the state um uh, big paper in columbia south carolina when uh, doug was projects editor at the state he and tony were competitors so when the post and courier hired him uh, tony says that he was a little bit leery and not just because uh doug wore cowboy boots uh, they actually went on to become close colleagues and uh, collaborators. And uh, Tony describes Doug as a master at identifying problems in a story, pushing reporters to dig deeper, 
uh, and to be more creative. He deeply believes in the power of local journalism to make communities better. Uh, Doug, thanks for being with us. Thank you, Steve. Thank you very much, Steve. I first met Tony in December 2003, uh, when I had just been hired to start the first investigative reporting team at the Post and Courier. Tony had been assigned to me as, as one of two reporters by the executive editor to be on the team. And after I finished my orientation that morning, I walked into the newsroom to sit down at my desk and get myself a little organized. And Tony walked over to me, introduced himself, although I knew who he was. And he said, with a very stern voice, I don't want to be on your team. I don't like this idea. I like working with the editor I used to work with. I feel very badly about this. I said something to the effect of, I'm sorry if that's the case, but you're going to have to take that up with the executive editor because he's the one who made the decision to put you on this team. I don't know if Tony ever actually went and talked to the executive editor about it. All I know is he ended up on the team and we ended up spending years working very closely together. During those years, I learned something over and over again. Tony is a fantastic writer, not to mention a fantastic reporter. But I learned from him that he has this system of writing that he calls the circle system. And one time he tried to explain it to me. He said, it's a system where you can take all the little facts, all the people you run into and, com and combine it into storytelling. I said, well, how's that work? So he sat down and he drew a graph. Do it. And I apologize to Tony for this one, but it looks something like this. Well, I have to admit, it was a little too mystical for me and my linear thinking. But somehow, Tony and I managed to work together over the years on numerous stories, both as uh, me as his editor, but very often as us, us with co-reporters and uh, co-writers. Uh, speaking of writing, um, I have to say that Tony has a skill that goes beyond reporting and writing. He has a skill, I would call it a gift, that lifts his journalism above most of us. Tony can conceptualize. This gift allows him to see things that many of us don't see. He can see the story that nobody knows about. And he can see the story in the story that everybody has written about. He finds a new and fresh way to tell it, a new way to make things special, a new way to help readers want to read, and a new way to help them learn. I'll give you one example of this. It's called On the Edge. In the middle of 2015, Tony came up to me and said, hey, Doug, let's get together and work on a story about sea level rise and climate change. He said, all the stories I've seen have had little impact on what people tend to think. People still act like this is never gonna happen or it's gonna happen decades from now or centuries from now. Uh, so I said, yeah, I think that's a great idea. We will just, he said, we'll just go along the coast. We'll find where this is happening and we'll illustrate it. We'll bring it right home and show people it's in their backyard and maybe they'll do something. So we proposed this story to our executive editor. He didn't really like it. He preferred us to go after corruption, but he couldn't come up with a better idea. So he set us loose. And uh, we were, we had done a couple of weeks of backgrounding by then and we were off on an interview when we got a telephone call. A um, black motorist named Walter Scott uh, had been pulled over by a North Charleston police officer for a broken brake light. And Walter Scott panicked during this stop and he ran away from the police officer and the police officer shot and killed him in the back. So Tony and I hurried back to the newsroom to get involved in that coverage. Shortly after that, Tony and I and several other reporters got together to do a series called Shots Fired. We detailed all of the police shootings, killings of people in South Carolina over the past several years. And then shortly after that, a white supremacist walked into the Emanuel AME Church in downtown Charleston and shot and killed nine prisoners. Needless to say, we didn't get back on 
on the edge too quickly. And by the time we did, we ended up doing a truncated version of it. But I bring up on the edge because I think it illustrates what's so powerful about Tony's reporting and writing because his journalism is always on the edge. It's always something new. It's always something better and it's always compelling. Thank you, Doug. Um, our next speaker is Jennifer Barry Howes. Uh, she Hawes. She um, works with Tony at the Post and Courier on the project team, uh, where she's established herself as one of the nation's leading feature writers. And uh, Tony says that he and Jennifer keep each other honest. Uh, one example he gave us was the Jen Hawes rule, never end a story with a quote. If that were the law, I would be in prison. But uh, in any event, she's part of the team that produced Till Death Do Us Part, which was a series about domestic violence uh, that I was thinking of earlier that won the Pulitzer a couple of years ago. Well, 2015, so a few years ago. She was also a Pulitzer finalist in feature writing in 2019. Uh, and her book, Grace Will Lead Us Home, The Charleston Church Massacre and the Hard Inspiring Journey to Forgiveness uh, chronicled the shooting and its aftermath, its impact on survivors and uh, victims' loved ones. So please uh, welcome Jennifer. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm thrilled to be here to have an opportunity to talk about Tony um, and would like to share a, a story about him that goes back to March 2007 when he and my husband, Alan, who at the time was a photojournalist at the Post and Courier, flew together across the world to China. Now, first, I should tell you that in our newsroom, Tony is known as the resident master of the junket. And here he was flying to China of all places. Second, you should know that Tony has an uncanny ability to spot stories where other reporters don't always see them. So before they left, due to some skepticism for the need to pay for a trip to China, Tony had promised to deliver not one, but four stories from a short trip to a country that he had never laid eyes on. And he did so. He brought home, brought home deeply reported stories about, one, a local paraplegic man who is going to China for stem cell treatments, two, a Charleston-based lighting company with a manufacturing plant in China, three, how the port of China compares to the port of Charleston, and four, how thousands of cheap knockoff paintings made assembly line style in China affect Charleston's art scene. So pretty amazing. Now for the first story about the stem cells, Tony was following a local man named Hal Burroughs, who was going to Shenzhen to get uh, stem cells injected into his badly damaged spine. This treatment of course was not available in the US and was the topic of considerable debate at the time. Now Hal would receive only one injection of stem cells while they were there. So Tony and Alan knew that it was imperative that they'd be able to document the procedure. Witnessing it was crucial to telling Hal's story, which was the main reason they were in China. Hal was all for it, but Chinese officials were less clear cut about permissions before Tony set out. So he and Alan went to the hospital anyway, determined that they would get the story and figuring they would talk their way in if they had to. As Alan tells it now, all was going well until he pulled out his camera after the procedure in front of one particular nurse who responded with a panicked look of alarm when Alan took pictures of Hal going back to his room. When this nurse confronted them, Tony and Alan insisted that they were just leaving and indeed they rushed from Hal's room before security arrived. They speed walked down a hallway to the nearest elevator, got in and turned around. And there, a line of hospital workers and employees from the stem cell company stood facing them. One of them asked Alan if he'd taken any photographs and Alan said that he had. A long pause followed that answer. Then the elevator doors began to close in front of them more slowly than any doors have closed before or so it felt in those moments. Tony and Alan were convinced that when the doors reopened on the first floor, hospital security staff would be waiting to grab them. What if the guards confiscated their equipment? What if they were tossed into a Chinese prison or worse? But in fact, nobody was there. Alan remembers holding his breath as they walked as nonchalantly as possible past some security guards on the way out. 
Apparently the guards hadn't gotten word. So Tony and Alan rushed outside, chased down the first cab they saw and hightailed it back to their hotel. They had their notes and cameras safely in tow. They had the story. This is classic Tony. Find a story, make it happen, be fearless and determined, and mostly think big on stories. What, you're a reporter at a small to mid-sized newspaper in South Carolina? Of course you can go to China and report on a good story. But in all seriousness, over the 20 or so years that I've worked with them, Tony's tenacity and skill has inspired our whole newsroom. I had the luck to sit kitty corner from him in our pod, at least before COVID hit, and will always appreciate the times he helped me think through stories, from framing to themes, and offer really meaningful feedback to what I'd written. So congratulations, Tony. We are all so proud of you and grateful to work with you. I cannot think of anyone who's more deserving of this award. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, next, we'll hear from Glenn Smith, who is the public service and watchdog editor at the Post and Courier, and he's uh, Doug's successor, I guess, in that role, and Tony's immediate editor and longtime colleague these days. He's originally from Connecticut, and Glenn and uh, Tony have known each other for about 20 years or so. Um, Tony tells us that Glenn's a top-notch editor and more of a partner uh, than a boss in a lot of ways, uh, but that he's um, uh, also direct when uh, he sees a way to make a story stronger. So um, sounds like a good editor to me and uh, delighted to have you, Glenn. Thanks so much. I'm delighted to be here. Uh, when I arrived at the Post and Courier back in the fall of 1999, uh, they gave me a desk across from this fellow named Tony Bartley. Couldn't have been more uh, welcoming or accommodating, but, but I was left just a little bit puzzled. Ostensibly, Tony covered the Ports Authority and Charleston's bustling harbor, but he always seemed to be chasing one story or another that had nothing whatsoever to do with his beat. He wrote about crumbling schools and nuclear waste, sexual predators and unfair housing practices. Stories that really exposed troubling and neglected problems in our community. Some editors didn't know what to make of this guy with the wandering interests. Tony would keep his head down and just don't bother me as he set out on his mission to tell these stories. Uh, over time, they learned to stay out of his way because Tony always delivered. Truth was, Tony's relentless curiosity could not be contained to a single beat or topic. Once he had his teeth in a story, there's no letting go, whether his bosses wanted him to work on it or not. And we're all the better for that. His work has had immense impact on South Carolina and beyond. He's charted new ground in science reporting, and he's held politicians and business leaders accountable for myriad misdeeds. His reporting has helped shutter a polluting coal plant, sent shady sheriffs to jail, and protect an elusive bird from extinction. Tony's truly one of the most versatile journalists I know. He's equally at home chasing hurricanes, ferreting out corruption, exploring climate change, or unraveling insurance ripoffs. He even knows a thing or two about pirates. You should ask him sometime. What unites his work is a passion for storytelling and stretching the boundaries of what's expected from local journalism. Tony's well known for his junkets, as Jennifer said. He's been to China and Africa and Greenland and all sorts of other places. And all the while, he manages to connect global themes to the issues back home in a way that's very relatable. But he's also quite adept, as people have pointed out, at finding hidden, hidden treasures hiding in plain sight in our own backyard. One such tale took us both deep into the Santee Delta, which is this vast, unspoiled estuary north of Charleston. Under the broiling summer sun, I watched him slog through hip-deep mud and battle razor-sharp sawgrass and clouds of biting insects. I had a video I wish I could show you of him running from a bunch of biting horse flies. Uh, but despite all that, he unearthed an incredibly rich story that mixed science, history, and nature. Tony often frames the stories in the form of mysteries that slowly unravel by the inch, entertaining and enlightening readers along the way. His articles are populated with memorable characters who help drive the narrative, like the NASA scientists in Greenland who moonlights as an Elvis impersonator. Tony's constantly searching for new ways to tell these stories, be it a graphic novel, an explainer video, or interactives. He memorably borrowed a unique thermal imaging camera, which had been mentioned before, uh, to, to track carbon dioxide uh, emissions. I can still recall the look on our editor's face when Tony explained that it would cost $10,000 or more to replace the camera if he broke it. Still, nobody balked at the idea. That's because in many ways, Tony's found a perfect home in this small newsroom that didn't quite understand him at first. 
It's become a place of great collaboration and experimentation. And that gives them the freedom to pursue stories that are outside the box, maybe even a little wacky at times. We're fortunate to have owners and newsroom leaders here who want to tell difficult stories that matter and make a difference in people's lives. And they're willing to give us the time and the support to take chances time and again to bring those stories to life. This year, Tony's been a leading force in our Uncover project, which seeks to shine a light on government misconduct in South Carolina. Tony helped conceptualize this project and line up support from all our community partners. We've published some two dozen installments to date, chronicling a host of misdeeds. Many of the stories come from areas of our state that have lost newspapers or where outlets are struggling to survive. It's not like anything we've attempted in the past and a model that shows great promise to be replicated in other parts of the country. Once again, Tony Bartlemy is bringing untold stories to light in an innovative way. We can't wait to see what comes up next. So congratulations, Tony. This honor is so well deserved. Thank you, Glenn. Um, now, it's always been a part of this uh, award ceremony to hear from someone outside of journalism <clears throat> for a different perspective on the winner. And uh, this year, we're going to hear from Tim Culp, who is a Charleston attorney and a former FBI agent who uh, sometimes describes himself as South Carolina's most heavily armed liberal. Um, he went into law after serving at the FBI and became one of Charleston's most effective and sought after criminal defense attorneys. He met Tim about 15 years ago, uh, Tony, I mean, of course, um, when he contacted Tony about a case uh, involving the death of a young pharmacist who had died from a gunshot to her heart. And there was a question of whether it was suicide or murder. Uh, her boyfriend uh, was a police officer and uh, the state police investigated and called it a suicide. Uh, but Tim represented the victim's parents and um, uncovered new leads that actually led to the boyfriend. And Tony's reporting uh, on the case prompted a coroner's inquest that determined the death was homicide. So uh, wonderful yarn and uh, really look forward to hearing from Tim. Welcome. Thank you, Steve. My friend Tony is a man of letters. I am a man of crimes. Crimes breed stories. We love stories, particularly stories about crime, it seems. People can't seem to get enough. I'm a criminal defense lawyer, but have also been an FBI agent, a prosecutor, and a judge. Occasionally, over my 42-year career, a case has walked in the office that I immediately know will live with me forever. In 2003, I fell into one of those cases that I became obsessed with. I refer to the case as the obscurity of the obvious. The characters in the case included one young woman shot through the heart, the daughter of my clients. Most of the other characters were cops, including her fiance, who one Monday afternoon that November found her dead in his bedroom, shot with his personal revolver. At that time, I had become a board certified criminal defense lawyer, not prone to moral outrage, but I was. Nothing I discovered in my investigation of her death suggested that Molly committed suicide. Every naked emperor parade the police orchestrated flew the flag of suicide as the cause of Molly's death. The facts I uncovered were ignored by everyone in any position of authority. I could not determine why. A few years before, I worked with a former reporter at Tony's paper on a story of national interest. I called her seeking someone at the newspaper who might listen to my story about what the police were intent on concealing. Sybil said, call Tony Bartleby. I had never met Tony. When he returned my call, I was in my car. I pulled over. I asked him if he had some time. The story I was poised to tell was long, and might not be a story. I have since related many stories to him that weren't stories. For an hour and a half, Tony listened patiently. When I stopped, he said he would get back to me. I wasn't sure if I would hear from him again. What I told him was a little hard to believe, and it still is. A couple of weeks later, he called and asked if I would meet with the editors. I did. 
After another few weeks, Tony and I began almost daily conversations. As I butted my head against an inability to secure anyone else's interest in what I believed was a cold-blooded murder, Tony was interviewing over 30 people, analyzing everything I provided him and working on a front page story. Considering the politics and the characters, nothing about the pursuit of the story was easy. The summer following Molly's November burial, Tony let me know that his story about the case would be in next Sunday's edition. I waited at the end of my driveway. My law partner bet me $100 that the story would never run. The paper came, no story. The next Sunday, the paper came, no story. The third Sunday, my partner had to pay up. The front page blared Tony's work. The title, What Happened to Molly? From the front page, the article ran three pages. Tony nailed the story. His piece brought warranted attention to the case and told the story of Molly's questionable demise. The universe of words and phrases is in the public domain and available to everyone. Tony's talent in delving into that domain and selecting words and their relationships to paint a picture of events, places, and people into a story worth reading twice is remarkable. This award confirms my opinion about his gift and talent. I'm proud to call him a friend and to participate in the recognition of his well-deserved achievement. Thank you. And thanks, Tony. Thank you, Tim. Uh, all wonderful uh, speakers, really wonderful remarks. And uh, I'm only sorry that we're not uh, together in person to, um, to celebrate and, and um, uh, acknowledge each other. But uh, we're going to do our best here on Zoom to uh, move now to the actual presentation of the award. So I think uh, Jelani gave you a good flavor of um, what, uh, what Ira brought to um, journalism really through this award and through his generosity uh, in, in funding scholarship and in his creation of the professorship and the center uh, that Chelani now leads. But uh, one uh, tradition that we enjoyed uh, right to the end of his life was just being with him at this ceremony where at this point he would uh, take the microphone and, um, and read out um, uh, his own kind of um, sort of mission statement for, for what this work, uh, annual work of evaluating candidates and selecting a winner was all about. So since his passing, we've gotten into the habit of just kind of reading off of his script as he left it behind. And that's what I'm gonna do now. So I'm channeling uh, Ira uh, wherever you are my friend. Uh, through his reporting, John Chancellor dispelled lies and ignorance. For the first time, the new age of television journalism enabled the world to see the ugliness of racial, racial hatred. And the result was a great advance for the cause of civil rights. That's why journalism is so important today and will be in the future. It's our first line of defense against those who would subject the world to lies and ignorance. By spreading truth and life, light, journalists have the power and influence to make the world a better place to live in. Not just for a few, but for millions or even billions. When he agreed to permit us to establish the John Chancellor Award for Excellence in Journalism, he envisioned rewarding the kind of journalism that would say to successful generations, this is the sort of work to which we should dedicate our lives. Tony's work meets that test. He has championed the principles that make society more hospitable to both tolerance and truth. And Tony, we honor the memory of John Chancellor by honoring your work. You have our admiration and gratitude for your contributions to journalism and to society. So in tribute to the life work of John Chancellor, we're really pre pleased to present you with the John Chancellor Medal for Excellence in Journalism and 
uh, $25,000 check, which I gather you've already received. Uh, so normally if we were on the stage, uh, uh, one of us would put the medal around your neck. I'm told you might have someone uh, willing to play that role, your partner, uh, Annie. Yep. <laughs> All right, well, thank you both. Congratulations, Tony, and the floor is yours. Uh, I'd like to begin first with a, a big thank you to the John Chancellor Award judges for so thoughtfully considering my work and the work really of our very talented newsroom here in Charleston. And thank you to the Littman family for keeping John Chancellor's legacy burning bright and to Steve Call, Lisa Cohen and so many others at Columbia who made this special moment happen. And of course, thank you, Kendra, Jen, Doug, Glenn, Tim, Annie, and all of you on Zoom for sharing this moment with me. So the other day I read a story about the actor Michael Keaton who had just been praised for his body of work. Keaton told the interviewer, I was raised Catholic, so I feel guilty even if I don't do anything. I know the feeling. So to assuage my Catholic guilt, I'm going to talk about other people, two in particular, John Chancellor and my father. Joe Bartlemy was a local television pioneer, news director in Minneapolis, Los Angeles, and New York, before moving to NBC where he produced the Today Show. And it turns out that one evening he was at a dinner function at NBC and so was John Chancellor. By all accounts, it was a nice spread, but Mr. Chancellor suddenly began to choke. Dad went over to him, helped him to his feet, did the Heimlich maneuver, and out popped a piece of cheese, saving John Chancellor's life. We all need a little help now and then, don't we? And I've had my share, from my first and patient editors in Greenville, South Carolina, to my equally patient editors in Charleston. They all helped me in so many ways, personally and professionally, thank you. Now, Charleston. Charleston is special. I arrived 30 years ago in an old Saab, more rust than car. It, I was a true outsider, not so different than the tourists that pour into the city. I remember walking through the historic district for the first time, gazing at the stately old homes when I suddenly found myself in a cloud of perfume, or so I thought. I looked up at a beautiful Annabella mansion and saw its windows were wide open. My first thought was, is this what the inside of an old Charleston home smells like? I learned later that this sweet scent comes from the delicate white blossoms of this tea aloe plant. But Charleston does that to you. It mesmerizes you, sometimes fools you. It draws you in with its beauty. And then like a grand novel, it reveals its truer self over time. And the truth is that underneath the layers of beauty are darker ones of injustice and loss. And it's these complex layers, these legacies, the tension between old and new, good and bad, that make Charleston a fantastic place to be a newspaper reporter. Charleston's newspaper, the Post and Courier, also is special. Its owners are locals. They know that a healthy paper makes the place they love better. They, they've shown the nation, they've shown the nation that you can thrive by investing in deeply reported stories, not fluff that you thrive by giving people more for their money, not less. In the process, they built something unusual, a local paper that has gotten better over time. I'm grateful for their vision and support over these many years. A career is an endurance race for sure, and we local journalists face daunting hurdles. So often it feels like there's no time to do the important work. So often financial pressures steer you to the brink of moving on to a bigger paper or another press in another profession altogether. I remember one low moment many years ago, questioning my path. Was I making a difference? And my dad sensed something was wrong. And he mailed me this speech that I'm holding in my hands right now, a speech by John Chancellor. Mr. Chancellor gave it in 1985 to the National Press Foundation for a Lifetime Achievement Award. He began by saying that journalists are different. Most get into the profession because, quote, they wanted to have fun, fun and freedom. But amid the fun and freedom, he said, quote, there was also murder, death, violence, hunger, and corruption. 
You saw day after day things that were wrong with society, and you began to think something more should be done to make it better. That didn't make you a Democrat or a Republican, but it made you think that action is better than inaction. Mr. Chancellor spoke about how this is a pivotal moment in a journalist's career, when you realize that what you do is truly important. That good reporting helps other people take action, make better decisions. But he's, he said it's a heavy weight, this responsibility, and journalists who survive find some way to balance it with that sense of fun and freedom that got them into the business in the first, in the first place. Mr. Chancellor ended his speech, quote, we began standing outside society looking in. That's where we ought to remain. We are the lucky ones who stayed the course, have taken that experience, that sense of fun and independence, and moved into more serious work. Mr. Chancellor's speech, that letter from dad, changed my life. I still read that speech now and then to remind myself about staying the course, doing work that matters, and most of all, that importance of freedom and fun. John Chancellor and my dad are no longer with us, but I'll always be grateful, always be grateful for John Chancellor's wisdom and for my father who recognized I needed a little help. So in the spirit of John Chancellor and Joe Bartlemy and the spirit of freedom and fun, in honor of all local journalists who have stayed the course, I accept your gracious award. Thank you so much. All right, I can't uh, wait for that silent gestural Zoom applause to be banished. Uh, but uh, for now, um, congratulations, Tommy. It's been an honor to associate ourselves with you and uh, what a wonderful ceremony, what wonderful colleagues and speakers we had. I uh, hope you uh, uh, take your, um, your team and your uh, check and go do something fun and free with it tonight. Uh, so congratulations again. Thank you all for being with us. Uh, thanks for the team to put the ceremony together, Lisa and Abby and uh, colleagues. And uh, you'll be invited uh, hereafter uh, to attend future chancellor awards and celebrate other winners. And we hope we'll have a chance to meet you at uh, Pulitzer Hall uh, on that occasion. So thanks everybody and uh, have a great afternoon.